The Northern Lights booked a trip down south. This has been something, some display the last couple of nights. A string of geomagnetic storms pushed hues of pink, green, and red across the lower 48 states, going as far, as far south as Florida. Now, this was a bright display generated by a powerful solar storm, a sequence of them. We're talking up to G4 level. That's almost into the top category of the scale. And here at Fox Weather, you often hear us talking with uh, storm chasers, hurricane hunters. What about aurora chasers? They exist, and we're getting them in the mix. We're joined now by Tom Kurz. He's the chief aurora chaser at Hertegruten. One of the coolest job titles, by the way. You're joining us now from one of the company's ships. Are you, are you chasing auroras right now? What's this all like? It's funny, we've come all the way to Norway to chase the lights, and meanwhile, many of our friends back home, including my family in Florida and up in Michigan, over in the U.S. where you are, have had wonderful views. Meanwhile, if you see me swaying, we are riding some 15 to 20 foot waves up here, so wow. it's a bit of rough sailing right now, but in the next couple of nights, we're going to break into some clear air under the auroral oval. It has been a very exciting week for aurora chasers, though, particularly after a, let's say, a, a somewhat quiet period of activity from the sun. As you said in your introduction there, a string of coronal mass ejections, uh, including one very large one, which cannibalized the others, have triggered some fantastic geomagnetic storms and uh, have an allowed people to get a glimpse of the lights outside of the Arctic in places where it isn't normally seen. Tom, I got to say, uh, the, the awesome title. I'm jealous of this gig. I think it's pretty easy to be amazed by the Northern Lights. And a lot of folks, millions of people across uh, the country stateside have gotten to enjoy that over the last uh, couple of nights. Your love is next level in a, in a gig like this. How did it all start? How did you get into that role? Actually, my history uh, with the sky goes back to a very young age. And I had the, the great fortune of growing up in the beautiful country of Scotland. As a young child growing up on the north coast of Scotland, we could faintly see the northern lights over the sea. And my father was actually a pilot in the Air Force here in the United Kingdom, and he uh, would fly under the lights in his fighter jet and tell me stories, which to a child was the closest thing you get to real magic. So I had a fascination from a young age. Uh, I now spend a lot of time chasing the lights in Norway, which is my favorite country to do it, uh, and sailing up here on these incredible Arctic ships. Uh, it gives me the opportunity to share that experience with uh, very curious would-be aurora chasers who travel with us from all over the world, including, I must say, many from the United States. Uh, but I also do a lot of research into aurora forecasting, uh, the history, the mystery, the contemporary science of the Northern Lights, trying to make that phenomenon a little bit easier to understand. Um, but it is it is a selfish career because I just love being out under the aurora. Uh, so I've tried to uh, engineer a, a career direction that allows me to do that as much as possible. Um, I will say that we don't always uh, see incredible mm -hmm. displays, but the chase, much like storm chasing, the chase itself is all part of the fun. I would think so, and exactly like you just described, folks on Fox Weather are probably tired of hearing about this, but the aurora for me is like the, the giant white whale. Uh, my wife and I even went up to uh, Iceland, and the cloud cover uh, canceled the cruise. No such luck. Even oh, in this dear. event, I didn't get to see it. But you mentioned the, the amount of interest. People come from all over the world to, to even just try to get a glimpse of this. What are some of the most common uh, misconceptions people have about the aurora? You must get a lot of uh, interesting questions all the time, I'm sure. You know, um, firstly, I just want to say open invitation for yourself and your wife to come I, with me. I would love I, to, I to think show I, you the I think we lights. found the right guy to finally check this <laughs> off the list for us. You'd be most welcome. And also, I will say, I, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of the, of the terrible circumstances of bad weather right now in the United States. And of course, bad weather is, is never good for any of us. But the reverse is true with the Northern Lights. It's actually space weather rather than uh, terrestrial weather. And we want the space weather to be bad. We want it to be turbulent and stormy because that's what brings us these beautiful displays. You may remember last year in May, there was a record strong storm which brought credibly visible auroras as far south as a few degrees 
degrees north and south of the equator. So really an extraordinary storm of historic note. And we have had a similarly impressive event this week. And for many people, uh, they get a glimpse of the lights. They might not see much color. And uh, while they point their phones at the sky and take beautiful images like the ones you see on your picture right now, uh, they tend to believe that the lights should appear more vibrant than they are. So that's a very common misconception. The colors we see in these photographs are real, but uh, our eyes, our perception of these colors in low light conditions is deteriorated. So we don't perceive the color as strongly. However, when you come up here to the north to the Arctic and you stand underneath the auroral oval where the lights actually dance right over your head, at times, the strength of color can be so vibrant that your mind's eye will remember it for the rest of your life. So I think color is one of the key things that people have misconceptions about. Another uh, common misconception is about the availability of the lights and whether they sort of switch on or off. Earth actually has two permanent uh, locations where the lights are more or less always active, but you do need a dark sky to see it. So if you're in the northern summer and you come up into the uh, the midnight sun, you're not going to get enough dark sky or indeed any dark sky to see auroras like these. But if you are here in the autumn and winter months, you can get spectacular views of uh, the northern lights during those very long dark nights. So you do have to brave the cold a little bit, but actually that cold air, what you feel that's all part of the experience, yeah. the touch of the cold air and, and the sound of the of the snow crunching beneath your feet or, or the wind that's blowing down from the north. That's all sort of part of the experience of immersing yourself in this natural phenomenon. So, yeah, the key misconception probably does revolve around how the lights appear to us by eye versus how they appear uh, in our photographs. But I will say that for me, the, the impression to the eye is infinitely more amazing to witness because the lights have a self-luminous quality. They impress themselves on your retina and you feel them as much as you see them. And it really is the displays that you don't take pictures of that you actually remember for, for the rest of your life. That's it. Well, uh, now I can't rest. I cannot rest until I, I see these. I'm so glad that so many across the country have had that experience and you can hear it uh, as you explain it to us. Uh, just the, the, the awe that, that it that inspires in so many people and the love that, that you have for it, uh, that must be, uh, some special experience, all part of the chase, as you said. That's Tom Kurz, Chief Aurora Chaser at Hertegruten. Uh, thanks for being here with us on Fox Weather. Happy chasing, and uh, save me a stateroom if you can. <laughs> we'll be seeing you. Thank, Thank you, Ian. I'll see you up here, okay? I'll see you up here one day. Sounds good.